So the bag itself is fairly intuitive. Not that you guys would need much help after you use it a couple times, but it's got a quick little strap just to tell you kind of where to open it, where to grab it from there. And then it's got a little hand pushing that button, but you can see the buttons on the device right when you open it. So you can just turn it on before you even get out of the bag. And that's how long it takes. It just calibrates itself, does a little self-check every time it turns itself on. So you know it's good to go if it obviously comes on without any major alerts or alarms or anything like that. Now ideally, I know Jason mentioned one-hand squads. If you did have multiple people working on a scene, somebody could obviously be in charge of getting this device ready. Someone would already be doing manual compressions. So as I put this device on the mannequin and talk through it, um, it kind of makes you feel like it takes a long time to get it on. Um, but we've had some pretty neat feedback from some of the agencies that work with it. That if you're able to get it on a patient within a 10 to 30 second um, time period, that's extremely reasonable. And what you have to remember is that 10 to 30 seconds, not necessarily uh, interrupting manual compressions. It's just kind of a total time, the time you start messing with it from the time it's actually going. You'll have some interruptions along the way, but they won't be continual interruptions. So we've got the backboard itself, and we've got the device. So there's only two pieces to it. So let's say this is already on and just sitting next to you. The person on the other end of the patient, you guys can just pull the arms up and easily slide this underneath there. We don't necessarily have to take the time to look for exact placement of the backboard originally. We'll worry about that after we get the entire device on. But the landmarks are real simple. Obviously it gives you a nice little picture. But these clips right here where the device clips on, you want this, those just to go right underneath the patient's armpit. So since we're only dealing with right here on the patient, size becomes less of a factor. It obviously is a factor, but it becomes less of a factor. Larger bellies, big shoulders, big necks, that, it's just irrelevant when it comes to this device. Um, so as long as we get that under, place it there, manual compressions resume. And then it doesn't matter which way it goes on. The important part is either the person who's most familiar with the device has the buttons facing them, and then you can feel comfortable that You'll obviously work with the buttons as quick as possible, so it can go either way. The key is it's real top heavy, like everything's up here. That's where the motor is, the motherboards, the pistons, the batteries, everything's up there. The rest of it's just a bunch of plastic. So um, you gotta use that weight to your advantage. And then with the weight of the patient, I can clip that on without even doing anything, and then I go right through the arms of the persons who's providing compressions on the other side, I might hurt their integrity a little bit, but they're still going to be able to get some type of perfusion off the heart while I get this on. If you heard a clip over there, clip this side, you hear a clip over there, then you know you're good to go. That is the, the final indicator of is the patient going to fit within the device. If you can clip it on, then you'll be fine. Because they can be a barrel chested enough all the way up here that if you're on that slope, going to give the, the greatest chance of success as far as the fitting, it can still accomplish two inch depth. It's still strong enough that if they're all the way up against it, it'll still accomplish what it needs to accomplish. If we move the skin away to get these clipped, and then we're all the way up against there, we're okay. We don't have to have a space to lower it or anything like that. That's just a, an extra luxury, if you will. So then we just kind of verify if we're in the right spot. If we're not, we just shimmy the device up and literally just hit their armpits and then we're going to be right here where we need to be from there. So we're not going to, the good thing is you don't have to take the time to move the patient around or anything. And this backboard is, with the plastic just slides up really, really easy right underneath them. So then all I do is lower, hit one button, kind of locks it in place, which is kind of hard to see. So it kind of sets it. So what that's doing is just, it's uh, not only setting itself so it's not going to deviate from one spot throughout the entire code, 
But it's also setting itself where it can say, okay, when I start doing compressions, I have a beginning point. So I know exactly where two inch depth is going to be because I've locked myself into place. And then when I hit go here, you'll see the first couple compressions are fairly light. It's trying to figure out what the two inch depth on this patient is. And then it starts going to full speed for um, either a 32 duty cycle or a continual. So then it starts the full, full two inch depth or after about the third compression, something like that. And then the, the simplest part of it is, is that all it knows is two inch depth. And then we got a bag bag. Or at any time you can switch it over to continual and then it won't pause for any breaths. So the easiest thing to remember is it just does two things. It does two inch depth and it does 102 compressions per minute, give or take two. So it could do 104, it could do 100. Kind of strange, but that's to, to be exact. So um, contraindications of when you would or would not use a device. It's as simple as if you would not do two inch depth and 100 compressions per minute on that patient for whatever reason. Doesn't matter what the reason is, you would not use this. If you would, then you would. So if you're dealing with a 12 year old kid that happens to be 180 pounds, um, obviously they fit here and work just fine. Take the time to package the patient's arms up here after you get the line started, kind of get that out of the way. So if you're moving them downstairs, or as you roll into the ER, you don't have to worry about their arms bumping, getting in the way whatsoever. I've had a couple of facilities tell me that one of the reasons why they didn't like the device was patients came in with their arms up and they had a hard time starting the line, so they would take the device off. So I said, why would you, why did you do this? their arms down and it turned into oh yeah that'd be even smarter so it's one of those things you kind of just got to get used to the device itself and how the little things can be used um, but it's all there to help you now when I pause it the best my, this is my favorite part of the device is the pre-shock and post-shock pauses so I pause it it always pauses that it's up at its peak so you're obviously never compressing the heart but it just pauses down there but I can go over to your life pack and hit analyze or do whatever you need to do, and then come back here, hit go, and then go back, charge the shock. So there's a chance you're going to get 8 to 10 seconds of good quality compressions <coughs> and have a nice profuse heart. But when you do hit the shock button, that in the manual world you would not have. So technically, you're eliminating all uh, unscheduled pauses. You know, any pause that you would have to to intubate the patient or um, difficulty with getting the line going or anything like that, obviously it's going to be a pause that you can't avoid no matter what device you are or are not using. But it's all those unscheduled pauses during compressions that we're obviously trying to avoid. And if this device is deployed properly and used right, all of those unscheduled man-made interruptions, they all can be eliminated. You only pause when you purposely hit pause. And that's obviously because you mean the pause, not because you're running to an issue. So for hands-on compression rates, minimum being 80, obviously you're shooting for at least 90, maybe 100, that you can accomplish that with this device a lot easier than you could with, I don't care how many people you have lined up and ready to do compressions. And then you don't have to worry about the inconsistencies, whether that's this guy's too strong and fast, this gal's too short, can't quite get to the patient, you know, whatever it is, this consistency or inconsistency is what we're trying to eliminate. So at any time, I could just go back here, raise this up, and just take it off, and then whatever you need to do, you can do. If it's, something goes wrong with it, if it gets in the way, whatever, it's not a large deconstruction far as how to get rid of it so it's out of your way. So it is a battery driven device. So that's what this gray thing is right here. This just pops right up. And it runs for 45 minutes on the battery. I can actually plug it into the wall with a regular plug and it can go continual for about four hours. 
for or there's not enough charge keeping up with the output. I've had a few hypothermia cases in the hospitals where people have done that for four hours and, and ran the device where it just didn't work anymore. Just trying to get the patient's temperature up. Actually heard it twice. Once was six hours and another one was four. And at both times they said the device didn't it stopped working. But that's obviously Uh, a lot of facilities are looking for uh, organ donations. Keep the organs viable. Um, unfortunately, they know the patient expired, so they'll maybe move them off to a different room, keep the device on because they know they are a, um, a donor candidate, and uh, keep those organs viable with the fusion of the heart. So it's, uh, it does its job with circulation. There's no doubt about that. Um, and that's all its job is, it's just to circulate blood. It's not going to save the patient's life. Uh, circulate blood, so you all can do that. As I get that a lot, you'll show me, show me all the documentation that shows where it actually saves lives, and I say it doesn't. It doesn't do anything of the sort. It circulates blood throughout the patient's body, and I think we all can agree that's an important part. Everything else works well with it, as opposed to it just being that magic pill. So. on the side a little bit more. So ear to ear with that alarm is less than six and a half inches. So if there's any patient that's less than six and a half inches from the the spine, the device is going to say, okay, I'm going to do two inch depth on someone who's pretty small. The chance of a possible damage. Standard compressions on them anyway. So therefore, I'm not going to let the device do it, and it won't work if that alarm is going on. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, here to here is 12 inches. And if they're so big, they can't get their chest in here, like I mentioned earlier, you're not going to be able to get the device clipped on. There's not going to be enough space to get their skin out of the way and get it clipped on. Now, there is an exact weight, 350. Is a number I'm comfortable throwing out there uh, from feedback from people I've talked to over the years. It is a, a, it's a good number to say if they're 350, I'd still try it. But if they're any more, there's a good chance it won't fit. Um, I've heard higher, I've heard lower, but it's all how we're shaped. Uh, it definitely doesn't fit everybody, but then again, what does, right? So, but the majority, we've done a couple studies. Um, like the largest one was a 3,000 base population, and it fit 90% of the people. So, and that was in Minneapolis, Minneapolis area. <coughs> what questions? Anyone's more welcome to come up here and push the buttons. So, with the new AHA guidelines. So, since it still meets the guidelines today, there's no change to change anytime soon. Okay. Um, obviously, we've all asked that question, and um, the response is just right now. Uh, three years from now, there's a good chance something like that could change. But, um, you know, quick little software update with those type of patient guidelines. Typically, what we do is we offer that type of stuff for free for a certain period of time. And if the agency or hospital doesn't take advantage of it, then typically it turns into a charge after that free period gets left off or expires. So until you know, until we have a strong case to change it, it's going to stay where it is. Because the feedback we get today from early ROS, high entitled numbers, and I mean, it's hard. I'd hard pressed to see it do any better than it already does. The key is if it's placed in the right spot, if it's doing 102, if it did 115, I'd be surprised if there was any different outcomes. I think it's the, the consistency, the recoil, the, uh, um, the two inch, you know, that's why I feel that uh, you're, getting, you're getting solid numbers off it. The only thing I didn't touch base on is the safety side. 
obviously the back of the angle. 